All ready to get weird in here? Let's do uh, it, man. Yes. <laughs> Let's get weird, everybody. Let's do it, man. So, Dave, what's um, up? Tell, you tell me why do you think Shay is going to win the MVP this motherfucking year? Well, all right. So, first of all, in order to understand exactly where I'm coming from here, um, I I'm not going to be looking at the chats because I have so I'm much. I'm pulling notes up the motherfucking chats right now. All right, you get the chats, man. You get the, chats. the chats. All right. Um, I'm going to get into this because the reality of what I'm my my brain keeps going back to is that like how can you decide which players are going to be an MVP candidate um, early in the season? Um, I think most rankings have Shea at number five, something like that. Um, he they have him ranking as the best shooting guard. Um, so it's nice to see that he's getting some recognition right there. Um, but for me, I, I like to go back to the history of the game. It's, it's something that I enjoy. So I, I like to get to the, the, the nitty and the gritty of it, right? But if you get back to where Shea starts and the fact that he's under 25. So next episode, we're going to be talking about Shea under 25, where he stacks up against uh, some of the other greats uh, like LeBron. Um, man, it's just going to be fun. I mean, like Dwayne Wade, LeBron. Um, Oscar Robinson. There's these KD. guys that Shea is starting to look like he, you know, connects with um, on stats. KD. So KD. we'll get back to that in a second. But for Shea for MVP this next year, let's go ahead and look at it. All right. First of all, the evidence. Last year, he averaged 31.4 points a game. All right. That's really close to when KD won the MVP with 32 points a game. All right. And that's something that we have to look at just because that was in 2013, 2014. Um, you know, it was something that you have to look at it in circle and say, this is something that, you know, in my opinion, has to be looked at. Um, so scoring credentials are there, especially if he only averages 0.6 points more a game this next year, right? He's going to get to that I mean, 32 points. It, it, I mean, seriously, 30 plus is already way elite. 32? You're just talking about a handful of motherfuckers who can play with that. Well, let's talk about how he's going to be able to get to that 32 points a game. All right. Last year, he shot incredibly well, 53%, 35, and 91. The fact that he's so close to having 50, 40, 90, which is such an elite level, I think is something we have to circle. So let's just say his efficiency level gets even better, right? He gets to that point where he is 50, 40, 90, right? That means he's averaging 32 plus points a game, all right? And he's doing something that not many NBA players has been, have been able to do over the span of a season, okay? So you look at the efficiency level and you start looking at players that have had efficiency levels like that. And guess how you got to compare him to? Motherfucking Steve Nash, man. Because really? that's how close oh, his efficiency Canada. numbers are start, starting to look like. And oh, the Canada. why that's so cool is because you think about Steve Nash and the fact that he was that player that, that Shea started watching as a Canadian growing up. You know, So the fact that his efficiency level and numbers are getting close to that is pretty fucking impressive. Yeah, I mean, Steve Nash, dude. Um, Steve fucking Nash, man. Two-time MVP. Two so time, there's another MVP that we can stack up against. Two-time thief of an award that belonged to Kobe Bryant. I know. It's like, give me that shit. Thank All you, right, man. Mike Let's go to the next Tony one. Stacking right? up those stats, baby. All right. The next one, um, we, you know, we, we in Oklahoma City have seen him a, um, a few years. Uh, Chris Paul. All right. We want to okay. talk about okay. Chris Paul and where Shea's uh, assist um, dynamic playmaking, I should say, not necessarily assist, but more of the dynamic playmaking that, that Shea has and why it's comparable to, to Chris Paul. Um, if you look at the way that Chris Paul leads the floor at all times, everybody looks to Chris Paul for that leadership. They look for Chris Paul for that, that, that moment that a play needs to be happened, that needs to happen at the very moment. Who's going to step up? That's going to be Chris Paul. I mean, Late in games, big shot, Chris Paul. Uh, late in games, a, a, a big pass needs to happen. You're going to find the hockey assist. You're going to find Chris Paul somewhere behind it. You know, we saw it in Oklahoma City. We've seen it um, in Houston. We've seen it everywhere else that Chris Paul has played. All right? So, for me, I look at that, and I'm like, okay, that's great. But more, more so is that Shea is a shooting guard, really. Right? And he's playing that, that general role, just like. Chris Paul plays that general role in that shooting guard position. You know how rare that is. Again, you mentioned it. He's uh, got the MVP snatched away from him twice. You know, like Kobe Bryant is that person that, that has that, that idea of, of shooting guard, but the, the playmaker, the general of the floor, 
you know, and <laughs> and the fact that you can say that that Shay who looks at Kobe as the best player of all time, which I, I love the fact that we can watch that video on, on YouTube anytime we want about Shea defending why Kobe's the best, right? And now you're looking at it and you're saying his leadership style and the way that he um, leads through that shooting guard position is elite. And it's something that you don't see very often with a shooting guard. And I, I really get excited, whether it's Chris Paul, whether it's Kobe, in, in that, that dynamic playmaking general role. You don't see a lot at shooting guards having that that desire to take that, you know? Yeah, yeah. You're talking about cross between Kobe, Chris Paul, Steve Nash, KD, KD. I mean, we're starting. Like, we're start. I'm trying to give like MVP candidates like an idea of what he can do, like why he deserves to be. What in up, the nine top five? Three. Shout out. Kobe is the closest thing. I mean, Shea is the closest thing to Kobe in the league. Amen. There we go. And then let's just let's just break down. Like if we were just talking about the offense, right? And that was it. There was nothing else. That'd be great. But we're not, right? His 1.6 steals a game as a shooting guard is fucking elite because mm -hmm. he doesn't just play the shooting guard level. He plays a small mm -hmm. forward. He plays the power forward sometimes on the switches and he gets stuck at the point guard position. You know, like he is thrown across the board on every level. Yes, we try to get him to have a little bit more of a relaxing time on defense, but that's not how it always goes. And because he's able to one average 1.6 steals a game and a one block a game, Gonzo, it puts him in the elite fucking level, man. And if you're looking at who that mimics, right, as a two-way player on offense and defense, man, come on, there, there's, there's very few players back in the history of the game. We got to sit here and we got to say the person that we got to compare him to is Michael Jordan on that aspect. <laughs> Steals, block shots, and the way that he is able to change the game on defense, man, that's what we're talking about. And when you're starting to add all these things together, right, that's what's starting to impress me now is because if you're talking about the defensive metrics with, with uh, uh, Michael Jordan and why that's elite level, well, think about it. It's because how many times did Michael Jordan win defensive player of the year? or was on the defense of all first teams like that shit matters. And if that we're saying that matter. Shea has that abil ability to get there, to get to that level, Michael Jordan's level, dude, that's what we need. That competitive spirit, that defensive versatility that he can go from any level and play at any level as, as a shooting guard. And I love that, man. You know, nine five says Shea SGA is greater than skinny Luca. Amen. Ooh. We're on a roll. I keep saying, amen. Like I'm in church and you're preaching. So I feel like we're on a roll. I'm just going to step back and just let the preacher roll. All right. So check this out, man. I, I get excited about this one because I, I truly believe that this year, the Thunder are going to be a top three team. So when Shea comes down to it, you've got to have somebody in the league that you can say just having a top three uh, team in the West or a top three team in the East, you're automatically going to have an MVP on caliber voter. You're probably a top three voter at that point, right? You can you know, pull back in the history of the game, blah, 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 blah. It's every single fucking year, right? Recently, Giannis. I see you, Milwaukee, right? Top four to six. You got Giannis. Okay. Team success equals MVP season. And that's, okay. that's yeah, Giannis. You got Joker. You've got all these guys that have figured out a way to have team success that will get there. And that's that to me, it's not, yeah, it's not a surprise at all. The seating is going to help you. And that's why I think the Thunder are going to do a great job at putting an explanation mark after Shea Gillis' is Alexander as MVP is because the team catalyst is going to be on point right now. Yeah, and that's where you come up with the bench. You talk about Giddy's contribution. You can really focus in on things like um, the progression you're going to see from J-Dub. That's something that isn't talked enough about. You know, Chet stepping out there and, you know, being able to contribute, go down the roster of our depth. So I, I, I see the validity of that because I expect – every element of our entire organization to take a step forward this coming year. Man, I, 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 we get a lot of people from Australia that said, Australia that say, uh, uh, Josh Giddy is a lot like Larry Bird. Right. And, and, and I love it, man. I love the fact that people are comparing them. So this next one, of course, is a little bit of Larry Bird, uh, charged. Um, but the reality is of what I'm going to talk about is the milestone candidate, right? When a candidate steps up and gets 50, 40, 90, and they're having a season like that. You got to look back in the history of the game. Like I said before, you got to look at those players that have done it before. You look at uh, Larry Bird. Uh, you look at these guys like that that have found a way to do it. And you got to circle that and say, you know what? I think that's the goal. So if he does it, it's a milestone candidate. I think it's one of those things we've seen happen with Shea. 
just because he got averaged a triple double the entire season, they called him a milestone candidate. You know, like this is something I mean, Russ, that yeah, but I'm with you, bro. So this is something that we have to look at and and look at and say, can he pull this off? If he can pull this off and have insane numbers at this, then yeah, the MVP trophy is his, bro. But you know, in order for us to do that, let's just talk to about uh, how do we get there? Because um, I, I've been talking about this with Mark, my brother John, with with my friends. Um, I, I I say this to everybody. I say people talk to me about like this Thunder team looks really good. When do you see them winning a championship? And I say always to them, I'm always like trying to put like a little breaks on. I'm like, next five years, I see us winning one. But this year's got me excited, man. Let me ask you the question and flip it out, bro. What's the earliest you could see us winning a championship? Glad you did that. Um, this year's got me excited. Uh, very few times in the history of the game I've ever seen a team that's put together so well with the coaching experience. We're going to talk about that in a second. But the, the idea from Wani, I dig it. that this team is way better than anybody realizes. Let's just say Shea comes out and has one of those, you know, uh, 50, 40, 90 seasons, and he averages 35 points a game, right? Chet's better than we think, right? Um, J-Dub's way better than anybody thought. And Josh Giddy's going to be, you know, flirting with and, and flicking that, that triple-double numbers. You know what I'm saying? If we're talking about that right there, um, I don't think that there is a reason why to say that this team that we have right now this year couldn't win a championship. And, and I, have, I have a number of reasons why I want to, you know, like, highlight that is. One, the most important thing that I think every team has to have in an 82-game season is roster depth. It's the most important thing because having roster depth, if you can pull 10, 12 wins out of your roster just because you're a deep um, team, then you have a chance to get to 60 wins. And this team that we have, this roster depth that we have is so elite. I have to look back and again, looking at the great games, looking at the great um, teams that we've seen in the history of the game, I look at the balanced 2014 Spurs team hmm. in order to be able to compare this team to what we have, guys. Like, I, I, I get it. People are like, oh, well, the Spurs had this, this, and this. But they, the depth that they had, I mean, they had so many players at any time and given moment that they can go out there and play at any time. And I look at that team and I say, that is how this team is designed. But we're so young, people don't realize it. You know, think about Mistic. Mistic would start on most of these teams. Hmm. You know, like, like Trey, right? Right? Trey would be a top seven player on most teams. Really? No doubt, bro. The way he's able to play is defensive level, but because of how many guards that we have that are elite level, he just keeps falling back because you can't compare him to J-Dub. You know, like you can't compare him to this player. You can't compare him to this player. And the more guards that we get, the fall further he falls back. And that tells me how deep we are in the guard level. And it's, it's an incredibly impressive, man. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, I mean, I don't know if, Trey's that good, but I do think it's going to be hard for him to sniff the court with the depth we have, that's for sure. His defense, his offense, he cares. He does a lot of amazing things. If he played for a team like the Blazers, he played a team like what I would consider half of the NBA, right? He would automatically mm -hmm. get what I would consider his starting minutes because he's, he's a great player. And a lot of people, like just because he doesn't get a lot of minutes and he's still learning how to play the game in Oklahoma City doesn't mean that he's not going to get a sick-ass contract when he's 28 years old, 29 years old, you know, like sometimes these guys take, um, you know, time, you know, you think about Poku, you think about the a, a, able to mm. play defense. Like some of these guys Love take some time. Poku. So because I, I, I look at this, the, the, the second point I want to bring up and, and, and what we're doing is the t defensive um, cohesiveness, bro. You think about whether it's, it's stopping fast breaks, you know, whether it's getting back, whether it's stepping up and playing this weird zone that we play that's more of a 3-2-3 two, um, two, matchup zone that, that switches on picks. And, bro, it's so elite. It makes everything else difficult for other teams. You look at it and you're saying, you know, how in the world is, is this team that good? You know, how in the world can this team have this many shot blockers or this many guys that can take charges? And then you start looking at teams balls. in the history of the game that have had defense like this, whether it's top five in every single stat, right? And the defensive aspect. And you got to look at one team. And that's happened in our lifetime. So I'm not going to like throw a 1984 team out there. But 2008 Celtics team, bro. 
their defense okay. was so next level. Whether, whether it was Rondo or KD or KG or I mean, it was so elite. Yeah, I agree. And and you look at that defensive Throwing team a big and big perk in there. Yeah, like you had one through five, man. You just they bulldoze everybody. It was sick, right? It was fun to watch. And I say that, and I, I look at this team that we have, man. And the defensive aspect that we bring to this table is intense, bro. It's yeah. insane. And and I'm telling you, when it, when people are looking at this team and saying, okay, well, Chet is very much like KG out there on defense. You know, people are, and then you're going to say, well, you know, you got a big point guard. You got this, you got that. Like how in the world, you know, you got Jay Will, like Kendrick or Kendrick Perkins. Like how in the world can people not start comparing that? To, you know, yeah. and then you start saying, okay, defense, right? Right. That, that's a pretty good stat, but it's a scoring versatility that gets me the most excited about all these things I'm bringing up because we've got one guy that can score 35, but I'm willing to bet that we're going to have two more guys that are going to get really close. If not over that 20 point mark a game. All right. I mean, I I'm telling you guys, we have the, the shots we, we, t- where our goal is to take over a hundred shots a game. All right. If our goal is to overtake a hundred shots a game, we've got the ability to get multiple guys. If we're incredibly efficient, again, going back to Shea, 40, 50, 40, 90, right? The other person that we want to talk about is J-Dub. If he can accomplish that or similar to that, 50, 40, 90, which I think J-Dub can do, right? We've got two incredibly efficient scores that are going to do incredible things. And the scoring versatility is going to be insane because you, you can't stop Josh Giddy and J-Dub and Shea. You're going to have to pick your poison. And most of the time, they're going to try to t- stop Shea, which is going to leave J-Dub and, and, and Josh wide open. And that's what's so crazy is the versatility and scoring levels on every single level. You got to go back to the 2017 Warriors team and understand exactly how many points this team is going to put up, the shot volumes that this team is going to put up. And you have to circle that 2017 Warriors team and say, yeah, 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 we're coming for those numbers. Remember their, um, their own motto, strength in numbers. Mm-hmm. And then it became like um, superstars are all we need. Super teams are all we need. But for a long time, the Warriors were known – I mean, you go back to another great Australian, Andrew Bogart, like underrated player for that first championship run for the, for the Warriors. Um, I know. And what 9-5 says here, I think is just as relevant. He says, I think Mitrich is going to surprise people. We have a great second unit with Mitrich, Kaysen, mm. Joe, Kenny Hustle, Jay Will. Our second unit has so much heart and hustle. Dude. That's heart it, and man. hustle. That sounds like a band name from the 1970s. Hell yeah, dude. And Give us that I- heart and hustle. It goes back to the next point is playoff experience. You t- talk about Mischich, right? He's had all this years in playoff experience and FIBA and Olympics and all this other shit that he's been able to accomplish in his life, right? He brings that playoff experience with him. You got Shea with playoff experience, you know, like you've got these guys that know how to play in the playoff Bertans and, and, and all these other guys that know what to do. And just because we don't have all the playoff experience, I'm telling you, FIBA counts, guys. That type of intensity, you know, I'm telling you, that is the type of intensity that you have to have in playoff games. So I feel those counts. So you're talking about a high end there. Next one, tactical coaching. I talked about it a little bit ago. You're talking about a, a coach that understands the game in a whole new way. I kind of look at him as like a young Eric Spolster, the way that he's able to understand, process the game, bring it in, put it in his head, put it out to the guys, and it's done. Like Eric demands people listen and you look at the way I, I coach D is able to understand process and teach it to the guys is truly elite. The defensive scheme, the offensive scheme, it's something that you don't see in young coaches very often. And it's why I believe, again, this team is designed for that. Yeah. And you brought up Spo. So, I, I mean, I want to mention something. It was pretty cool to see him um, with the team USA in yeah, the it Philippines. Was. It was really cool to see the connection the Filipino people have to Eric Spolstra in, in the sense that it just connects everybody. And I feel like the sense that like, that's so important for the globalization of the game. It's not just like, mm. Oh, we have, you know, we have talent that's playing, but like You're we right. have thinkers, we have coaches, we have general ex- executives, we have people that like, just because if you're not the talented guy out there, like as far as athletics, you can still make a difference in the NBA Eric Spolstra went like D three or something. And that meant a lot. I know Team USA disappointed a lot of people, but what was incredible was watching Eric Spolstra be embraced and him embrace 
the, the community. And I know, I believe I know that he's going to be the future of sure. Team USA coaching. Um, I'd like to see that. I think that would have been preferable over Steve Kerr. I agree. All right. Clutch factor. Last thing, and then I'm going to sum it all up for everybody here. But clutch factor. Let's just, let's just bring this clutch in there. All right. Um, I think it was too cool that brought it up that we lost 14 games by five points or less, right? Something like that, okay? So if we're able to come out here and have that clutch that I know that we're able to have, I know that we're able to close out games because we're constant. We, we keep that, that um, you know, metal to the pedal at, at all times. And, and, and you look at the building years. You could say pedal to the metal, but metal I like how you say it, dude. I like how you, you say look, it. You look at the building years and, and how many times were we down nine points that – that there was 50 seconds left that coach we score and coach D's calling timeout, mm -hmm. coaching the guys up, you know, making them hustle. Every single last bucket counts, you know, like all those years of, of going through that has taught these guys how to act and how to be in the clutch factor. Um, you know, and, and goes back to the clutch teams that we've seen in the history of the game. If the thunder can find out a way to be that clutch team, bro, what does it tell me? It tells me that there's only few teams that have ever had that clutch factor that you've got to really look at and say, you know, it, not having a player like blank may, would have made them lose, you know, 20 games, you know, and that player would have been the Chicago Bulls in 1998, man. Like that team was so close to not having, you know, some of the wins that they had. And if it wasn't for Michael Jordan and doing what he did, bro, come on, game over. So with that being said, all right, the combined reasons. For Shea and the Oklahoma City Thunder is the thunderous surge, bro. That's what we're going to go with, man. It's the thunderous surge that people yeah. are going to start understanding and feeling it. And it's going to start coming and coming and coming. It's that moment like everybody's like beating their fucking chest. That thunder surge moment. You know it's coming. It's here. There is no moments otherwise that we're sitting here and saying, is this year a good enough year for the Oklahoma City Thunder? We've got our MVP candidate. We've got a team that is deep. That's great on defense. That is efficiently on offense as any other team that we've seen in the history of the game. What does that tell you? We have young players. And just because we have young players does not mean that's a fucking diss, that that's a fucking insult. That's a fucking kick in the nuts. And that's a fucking disgrace because you have a young team. There's no way you're going to make it. That does not happen this year. Sam Presti knows it. Coach D knows it. If you are at all in tuned with what's happening in the NBA, you know exactly that this team is going to win 50 plus games and they're going to put their foot in the mix this year to be a championship caliber team. Boom, boom, bada bing, bada boom. True on that, motherfuckers. Shout out 95 Moani, Gonzo. Love you guys. Thanks for joining us, everybody else out there. We love you and we will see you next time.